Thank you for your grace and love. We thank you for the gift of eternal life possible because of the shed blood of your beloved Son, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that our time together and study of your word uh, may be uh, a blessing, profitable, enlightening. Uh, we pray, Lord, that as we continually study uh, who you are and what it is you're doing, may we be filled with joy, may we have meaning and purpose in life, and as always, may all things honor and glorify our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, please turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. This is actually lesson number two in our, quote, mini-series on Calvinism. Last lesson, we asked the question, what is Calvinism? So I hope we provided a, uh, a definition and an explanation of what Calvinism is. Uh, this morning, we're going to ask the question, and I hope we'll begin to answer uh, the question, what is tulip? You can't disassociate the tulip from Calvinism, okay? If you recall, uh, we're going to have, our study will be divided into three parts. Part one, we're going to study the, the issue of salvation. Part two, we're going to study the issue of sovereignty. And then part three, we're going to address the issue of sanctification. We're going to focus specifically on the purpose of the law, okay? So for part one, we're going to examine the doctrine of salvation. The tulip articulates five specific points that a, quote, Calvinist uses or a Reformed theologian uses in teaching the doctrine of salvation. Is it biblical? And I trust that we'll demonstrate it is not biblical, okay? So anyway, we're going to, we're going to begin here in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, verse 1, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. I wanted to begin here because this verse is used as a proof text to demonstrate something con what uh, called total depravity, okay? We'll get to that in just a few minutes. But uh, we want to ask, what is TULIP? TULIP is an acrostic or an acronym that was coined in the 1800s by students of Calvinism to, uh, to help uh, learn and articulate five specific doctrines, okay? Interestingly enough, historically, these five points were articulated by the remonstrants. Now, last lesson, we looked at traditional church history. We, we had a quick view of the traditional uh, view of church history. And remember the fountainhead, Augustine, and from that fountainhead, Augustine, you have two streams of theology slash philosophy. One uh, branches out to the Roman church, Catholicism. The second branch uh, goes out, the stream goes out to uh, Reformed theology, okay? That's where Calvinism is uh, t connected to all that. Long story short, uh, back in the uh, early 1600s, there was a, a student of Calvin or Calvinism, if I can say it that way, uh, Augustus, and um, I'm sorry, not Augustus, Arminius, and his students, uh, Arminius and his students, the Arminians, I guess if you want to call it that, they challenged some points that were taught by Calvin. Now, Calvin was already dead, but long story short, in, this, in 1610, the students of Arminius they challenged five specific doctrines that Calvin taught. Calvin didn't sit down one day and say, I'm going to come up with the tulip. Now, these are the five points. A Calvinist will tell you that there are thousands of points in, quote, Calvinism, okay? A Reformed theologian once said, Reformed and always reforming, okay? So when we talk about the five points, it certainly isn't to suggest that there are no other points in this whole philosophical theological system. So at any rate, um, the students of Arminius, they're the ones that challenged five specific areas of doctrine. 
So uh, back in 1618-1619, the Synod or the Court of Dort, they uh, convened and they responded to these remonstrants. They, they, they balked, they protested, okay? These are five areas that Arminius uh, challenged and disagreed with. And so now the students, they formally approach uh, the, quote, church. So the Synod of Dort, they codified, they articulated by in answering the uh, Arminians uh, these five specific points. So long story short, in the 1800s, it eventually uh, became known as the tulip, okay, the infamous tulip, all right? Uh, but again, the remonstrants are the ones that actually uh, identified these five points. The T stands for total depravity. The U stands for unconditional election. L stands for limited atonement. I stands for irresistible grace. And the P stands for the perseverance of the saints. Now, I understand this would be considered the garden variety tulip. There are softer, more flexible uh, views regarding these five points. Uh, there are different names that are sometimes used. Um, for example, about it, I am going to read uh, from uh, a source. It's called um, The Five Points of Calvinism Defined, Defended, and Documented, all right, from their lips to our ears. Interestingly enough, at times, if one challenges Calvinism or Reformed theology, uh, we are often accused of misrepresenting what is taught. I understand there are different shades and flavors of Calvinism. I understand that. We're talking about classic or strong Calvinism. There is softer versions. There are more flexible versions of Calvinism. We can't address every shade and flavor of Calvinism. We're talking about the classic or strong view held, okay? And uh, we certainly want to avoid misrepresenting uh, what is being said from the Calvinistic camp. So it's always wise, well, let's go to the source and let them tell us how they would teach these five specific points, okay? So from this particular source, the five points of Calvinism, uh, again, uh, defined and uh, defended and documented. Uh, the T stands for total depravity. Okay, now this is how total depravity is viewed. High Calvinism, okay? Again, not every Calvinist is going to agree. This is the definition. Because of the fall, man is unable of himself to savingly believe the gospel. The sinner is dead, blind, and deaf to the things of God. His heart is deceitful and desperately corrupt. His will is not free. Luther wrote a paper, eventually became a book, called The Bondage of the Will. Uh, I'll repeat, his will is not free. It is in bondage to his evil nature, therefore he will not, indeed he cannot, choose good over evil in the spiritual realm. Consequently, it takes much more than the Spirit's assistance to bring a sinner to Christ. It takes regeneration by which the Spirit makes the sinner alive and gives him a new nature. Here is the traditional sequence of salvation as taught by the classic position of Calvinism. Regeneration first, then faith. Okay, that's the sequence. God, via the Holy Spirit, first has to generate life. In fact, we'll read, and I'm going to quote some of these guys, you have to be born again before you can believe. You have to be born again before you have faith to believe. Okay, that's the sequence taught. I trust we'll see passages that shatter that philosophical approach 
to the things of God. Um, It takes regeneration by which the Spirit makes the sinner alive and gives him a new nature. Faith is not something man contributes to salvation, but is itself a part of God's gift of salvation. It is God's gift to the sinner, not the sinner's gift to God. Okay? So we'll, we'll address all of that, and uh, we just want to be mindful that, to sum it up, total depravity, as taught by high Calvinism, uh, really means total inability. All right? In other words, man has absolutely no capacity to respond to any claim God can ever make. So when God issues a command, he issues a command that a sinner is unable to comply with. So God, according to the tenets of Calvinism, has to regenerate that sinner so that the the sinner now, uh, as regenerated or as born again, now has a capacity to to respond positively to the claims of Almighty God, okay? So uh, just, just keep that in mind. Man will not, man cannot. Man has no ability to respond to whatever God is doing, whatever God is revealing. Somebody said, the heresy of free will dethrones God and enthrones man. They believe that faith, if you and I exercise independent faith apart from God's regeneration, that that is a human activity and that your faith now contributes to your salvation. Okay, That's the tenet of total depravity. And we'll get to this verse here in just a second, but this is a a verse that is commonly used, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were what? Dead. So you'll find a little comic book attacks against us, and you'll have a guy in the cemetery with a table offering free whatever. And, And, you know, it's free, but nobody's coming out of the grave. Why? They're dead, incapable of responding. Now, let me just read again from prominent Calvinist or Reformed teachers um, and what they say about, quote, total depravity. Okay, I'll just name some of these guys. Talbot and Crampton, they write, the Bible stresses the total inability of fallen man to respond to the things of God. Um, Regeneration must precede salvation. Uh, Once he, the sinner, is born again, he can for the first time turn to Jesus. You have to be born again. You have to be spiritually regenerated. Now you can turn to Jesus. Um, R.C. Sproul, he declares, a cardinal point of Reformed theology is the maxim, regeneration precedes faith. And we're going to give you, I'm going to give you a bunch of verses where you don't find that sequence at all. You don't find regeneration preceding faith. We're going to find out, well, the verses are saying faith precedes salvation. Um, Again, just to, uh, here's another guy, uh, Palmer, okay? And uh, no man can understand the gospel. This lack of understanding is also a part of man's depravity. All minds are blind unless they are regenerated. Um, Here's this uh, London Baptist Confession of the 1600s. As a consequence of his fall into a state of sin, man is is not able by any strength of his own to turn himself to God or even to prepare himself to turn to God, okay? Um, The sinner of himself 
cannot repent and believe. Uh, another guy, without the regenerating grace of the Holy Spirit, they are neither able nor willing to return to God. Okay, And I'm going to quote Spruill one more time. The Reformed view of predestination teaches that before a person can choose Christ, he must be born again. Man, uh, one does not believe first, then become reborn. So we, we want to be familiar with the, the first point, okay, which is, again, total depravity. Now, here is the consequence of this idea of, quote, total depravity as defined by the Calvinist, okay? Faith has to be a gift. Faith is something that God gives to that regenerated sinner, okay? But the sinner must first be regenerated. Now, I'm going to throw out just two terms that is commonly used in uh, Calvinism. Uh, you have monergism and you have synergism, all right? Again, those are just two words. We're not going to be all worked up about it, all right? Mon, mon, mono, alone, monergism. Uh, energy, ergo. God alone works salvation. Synergism, which is what we're accused of, by the way. Sin, as in together, uh, uh, ism or uh, synergism, again, work together. In other words, we're accused of teaching and believing that God and uh, the sinner work together to achieve salvation. Now, that's a misrepresentation of what the Bible teaches regarding faith. In other words, they believe that man, if they have free will, if free will is true and I exercise freely and independently my free will to believe what God says to me about the cross of Calvary, I now, through an act of human effort, Faith now becomes an, a, a human activity. I now am cooperating with God. I am now contributing to my salvation. And they will condemn that, okay? Well, if you don't believe faith is a gift, then you're left with the only alternative, according to Calvinism. Faith now is a work. So synergism, as they would teach it, means, well, then you believe you and God work together in tandem to produce salvation. So the premise is all wrong, all right? We're, we're going to work through some of that. Uh, number one, what, it, for, by the way, uh, is man so totally deprived that they have no ability, they possess no capacity to freely respond to whatever it is God says. Okay, no more. We've got to ask that. Is that what the Bible teaches? Uh, is man so totally deprived he could never respond without God's miraculous assistance? Okay? Is faith a gift? And if faith is not a gift, is faith a work? We'll look at some of the verses that they use. Okay? And of course, we're going to have to answer the question. Does a sinner first have to be regenerated before they now have a capacity to believe, to respond in faith, okay? Here we have in verse 1, and you hath he quickened who were what? De you see, you're dead. If you are dead, can you hear anything? Can you respond? Dead means you're dead. You have absolutely no ability or capacity. That's why you have to come up with this philosophical system called regeneration. How can a dead man believe? You're dead. Well, wait a minute. We need to understand what does the Bible mean when the verse says, you're dead. Let's go to a couple of passages. Go to Luke chapter 15, okay? Again, don't let... If you start arguing doc, doctrine or whatever it is you want to argue, but, but it's, it, it has the wrong supposition. If you are presupposing something, if you already begin with the wrong premise, it, it, you're going to you know, have a lot of 
theological problems, all right? The idea that being dead demands it is an absolute impossibility for anybody to respond. That's the wrong premise. Death in the Bible does not mean a sinner can never, ever respond or exercise independent faith, okay? Here's an example. Luke chapter 15. Remember the infamous prodigal son. Remember that guy? We call him, you know, traditionally it's called the prodigal and so on and so forth. And uh, we're not going to go through the, the whole incident here, but if you remember in Luke chapter 15, verse um, 11, okay? Luke chapter 15, verse 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And you remember the rest of the story, right? Uh, the guy, he, you know, the, the younger guy, he wants his inheritance. And so the father gives to the younger kid uh, the inheritance. Verse 13, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Okay? Is, this, is the young son busy and active? I mean, oh my, look at that. We got a whole family reunion here. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, verse, uh, verse 13. Now look at what this kid is doing, if you allow me to call him a kid. Verse 13. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together. He took his journey into a far country and wasted his substance with riotous living. Now look at what the father, his father, how did his father describe the behavior of his son? Drop down to verse 24. For this my son was what? He's dead. How can a dead person travel into a foreign land as a stranger? How can a dead man spend the inheritance? How can a dead man participate and behave in debauchery and riotous living? Is he dead or is he alive? Yes. But wait a minute. Does God have the right to use language to communicate something, a spiritual principle? When the Bible says you and I are dead in trespasses and sin, does that demand complete inability to hear? Or could God teach us that death has more than just one meaning? When the father here says, my son was dead, the relationship between father and son didn't exist. While the son was in a foreign land, blowing all the cash, living like a Gentile, living like an unbeliever. Okay? So wait a minute. The son is dead, according to the father. But the son is out there. It dropped down to verse 32. Verse 32, uh, well, no, I'll tell you what, let's read verse 24 again. Verse 24, for this my son was dead and is what? Oh, he was resurrected. Wait a minute, what does it mean when you're dead and you're alive again? Isn't that resurrection? Was this kid resurrected? Now, can, the, can God communicate a spiritual truth, a spiritual concept? We learn something about being dead relationally, but we also learn something about being resurrected. Now, the kid was not literally dead, was he? And he wasn't literally resurrected. Does God have a problem calling him dead and calling him alive again? Drop down, uh, uh, keep reading verse 24. He was lost and is what? Found. And they began to be merry. Now, drop down to verse 32. It was me that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Don't let philosophy define Bible words. Amen. Dead does not mean a natural inability to respond to God. By the way, you know what this kid did? Look back up there at verse um, 18. Look at verse 18. I'm sorry. Uh, verse 17. Verse 17. And when he came to himself, he said, you know what this kid did? He used the very reasoning. He began to assess and evaluate. 
he exercised his free, independent prerogative. He came to his senses. He realized, wait a minute, something ain't right. But as far as the father is concerned, you're a dead man. You're dead. The relationship. Here's another example. Go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Okay, let's use the Calvinist definition or understanding of total depravity, specifically the concept of being dead. In Romans chapter 6, you know what? If, if, if I'm going to subscribe and, and, and agree with the Calvinist definition of death, then let, let's read Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Look at verse 2, God forbid. How shall we that are, what? Dead to sin live any longer therein. Wait a minute. As believers, and by the way, it's talking to believers, right? We understand in verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is what? Okay, if dead means you have absolute no capacity and ability. You know what verse, if you're going to hold to that definition, look at verse 2 again. How shall we that are dead to what? That means I don't sin anymore. Who here in this room will claim I don't sin anymore. You know why I'm dead? I have no capacity to sin anymore. I have no ability to sin. If we're going to take the word dead, right? Now, the problem is, when Paul tells us we are dead, that means you can't respond. That means you can't uh, um, uh, react. That means you can't uh, uh, um, operate. In the re- that means you don't sin anymore. Isn't that wonderful? Because that's what dead means. That's what it means to be dead. Then why does Paul in verse 6, for example... Say, look there at verse, uh, I'm sorry, verse 7. For he that is dead is what? Freed from sin. Okay, verse 12, drop down to verse 12. Let not sin therefore. Wait a minute. Do you have the prerogative to allow it to reign? By the way, look at, read verse 12. Let not sin therefore what? But wait a minute, I thought I'm dead. And if I'm dead, that means there's no way I can respond to it anymore. You know, this is an act of the will here. When, when God exhorts the believer, don't let it rain. Is it possible that it might have a capacity to rain? Then words, otherwise words have no meaning, right? Verse 12 again. Let not sin therefore rain in your mortal body that ye should what? But wait a minute, I'm dead to sin. How can a dead man obey sin? If I, as a believer, am dead to sin. You see, we have to exercise extreme caution. Let the Bible teach us what these words mean. And so you have a Calvinist till they're blue in the face. No, you're dead. You can't obey. You can't believe. God by grace, and that's why they call it amazing grace, they call it sovereign grace, God by grace has to enable you to respond. Well, I'm going to use your language, I'm dead to sin, how in the world I cannot obey sin, I'm a dead man. It doesn't work, does it? Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it. Is it possible for a dead believer to obey sin? Otherwise, the verse has no meaning. Why would God command or exhort or teach us to do something that I have no capacity to comply with? But that's what Calvinism does. You better believe or you go to hell. But you don't have a capacity to believe. I command you this day to do something, but you don't have, a, you, you don't have any ability to comply, do you? What kind of a convoluted God? Because that's the God of philosophy. It's not the God of the Bible. Adam and Eve, Adam, thou, of all the trees of the garden, thou mayest what? But of the tree of the, of, of, you know, the, the, good, the knowledge of good and evil, thou mayest what? Don't eat. But if God already preordained and decreed that, wait a minute, Adam, you're going to eat of it. You're going to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam, do not eat it, wink, wink, but you don't have a, an ability to comply. That, that is, in essence, what they're advocating. God making demands from the creature that have no capacity to comply because that's God's decree. I mean, it gets... So let's start with the premise. If we demonstrate the premise is wrong, the supposition is erroneous, 
the whole tulip collapses. It just doesn't work. And by the way, when we get to part two and we're going to study, quote, sovereignty. Oh, uh, by the way, where in the Bible do you even find the word depraved or depravity? Okay. So anyway, when we get to part two, sovereignty, we're going to talk, we're going to look at free will in more detail. Okay. We're going to look at free. In fact, it is just absolutely amazing. The wisdom and genius and glory of Almighty God. God is never threatened by his creature and giving to his creature the ability to freely exercise their free will. God says, listen, you, you, we're going to find some amazing thing. I, and I'm going to say it. In, in, it's a rough way of saying it. God is negotiating with his people. This is just, to me, just incredible. God is not threatened when he communes and he fellowships and he enjoys a relationship with his people. And, and he allows his, his people to make choices. And God says, all right, you want to do that? I'll do this. You want to do that? And God says, you know what? I would have preferred you did this, do this. But you chose to... Now, isn't that fascinating? We're going to find verses where God actually says, I will have had you do that. But you did this. Wait a minute. We're going to define sovereignty. Supposedly, it's God's counsel. It's God's good pleasure. It's God's will. How can God say, that was my will, but you did that? Now I'm already starting to talk about it, right? I've got to stop. Our Father who art in heaven... Uh, our Father who art in heaven, um, hallowed be thy name. You can tell I pray the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> our, Father who, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is where... Well, isn't God's will being accomplished on the earth? Why would Jesus pray, thy will be done on earth? Isn't it already taking place? See, there's language that's going to lead us to demolish some of the philosophical systems, okay? We're not there, so I'm going to stop, okay? So here we go, uh, Romans chapter 6, drop down to verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. We're going to look at this sequence, okay? Faith first. Belief first. So, go back to Ephesians chapter 2. Now, I, I, I hope we have at least two verses, or two passages, right? How the word dead is used. And in both of those passages, whether it's Luke chapter 15 or Romans chapter 6, I can see how death works. And it doesn't fit the high Calvinist view of total depravity. It, it doesn't. Because in both those passages, we see things that can still operate in the life of a dead man. So, so well then exactly, and the question is, well, what's Paul talking about, for example, here in Ephesians chapter 2? Well, interestingly enough, after Paul declares in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, and you have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, Paul's going to help us understand what he's saying. Go to chapter 4. Go to Ephesians chapter 4 and notice there in verse 17. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord that ye henceforth walk. Huh. Keep your finger there. Go back to chapter 2. Look there at Ephesians 2, verse 2. Wherein in time past ye what? Can a dead man walk? So stop. Wait a minute. A dead man can respond. A dead man is active. A dead man can walk. We have to understand the Bible definition of dead, okay, especially in this context. Go back to chapter 4, verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. You know what it means to be dead? It simply means you're spiritually separated from God. It simply means you're alienated. Does, is that the same as total inability? You see, they now are trying to define. They, they take an idea, a concept, and, they, and that's how, quote, theology philosophy works, right? The wish becomes father to the thought. So wait a minute. Dead means you have complete inability. Wait a minute. Dead simply means there's no relationship. 
How do you conclude, in this case, that the sinner can't respond? To be dead means you're alienated. There is no relationship. There is no positional uh, relation between the two, just like the father and the son, the prodigal son. My son was dead. There was no relationship. We've been separated. We've been cut off. But the son's pretty active. And he also came to himself, came to his senses. He began to think through some of this. And he had a change of heart. And he went back home to his father. The father says, now you're alive. So let the, we're going to let the Bible to be dead simply means there is spiritual separation. There is no relationship. That does not mean I haven't read anything yet about total inability. Because that is a philosophical approach to the study of God's word. Let's go to, another, let's go to Mark. This passage to me just blows me away. Well, I think every passage should blow you away. I understand that. But, but in light of some of the teachings, the tenets of high Calvinism or classic Calvinism, uh, Mark chapter 4, this thing, this verse, Mark chapter 4, and look there at verse 11, okay? Mark chapter 4, verse 11. And he said unto them, unto you, talking to his disciples, okay, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are, what's that next word? Are these guys believers? So, okay, come on. God, the Lord Jesus, he's, he's making a distinction. Two categories, right? You, my disciples, I, uh, you, to you people, you who have believed me, to you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, right? But unto them that are what? They're not part of the group here. These are the ones that are rejecting the claims of Messiah, okay? To those people that are without. Unto them that are without, all these things are done how? In a, so here's the Lord Jesus. He's using different language when it comes to the unbeliever, those that are without. He speaks in a certain way. So why? Why is he, why is he changing the way he's communicating? Verse 12, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing, they may hear and not understand. So the Lord Jesus, he's going to begin to communicate and to teach in such a way so that they cannot perceive and they cannot understand. Okay, that's an act of judgment against a Christ-rejecting nation. Okay, that's an act of judgment. We're not going to get into the spit. Okay, so why, does he, why is the Lord doing that? Look at the end of verse 12. Lest at any time they should be converted. And their sins should be what? There's two things. Number one, notice the sequence. What, first of all, this is, let's get this out of the way. Notice the sequence. What precedes conversion and forgiveness? Hearing it. Seeing it. Okay? Okay, that's, but more importantly, the Lord Jesus says, if they understand what I'm saying, they're going to get, they'll be converted and forgiven. Did you catch that? Jesus says, I am deliberately going to communicate so that they can't understand. Because if they understand, they're going to respond and I'm going to have to forgive them. Wait a minute. I hope you catch the implication here. The Lord Jesus is deliberately not communicating plainly and clearly because he doesn't want them to understand. Because if they understand, they'll respond and they'll get saved. Wait a minute. According to the doctrine of total depravity, God has already predetermined who's going to be regenerated. For me, where, what happened to the regeneration of the Spirit? What happened to total depravity? Wait a minute. Aren't they by default, those who are without, aren't they by default incapable of believing and responding? According to the philosophy of, of, of total depravity, by default, they already have no capacity. So why would Jesus say, I'm going to use parables so that they cannot understand it? Because if they understand it, they're going to believe it. So Jesus will teach in parables. They don't understand it. 
they're not converted. This passage is a powerful argument against the philosophy called total depravity. The Lord Jesus deliberately not communicating to keep them blind. Isn't that interesting? That, that to me is a powerful... Go to chapter 6. Go to Mark chapter 6. Man, in other words, if you understand what he's saying, you might believe it. And then you're converted. Jesus says, I don't want you to understand it. So I'm going to say it this way. Because you might... They might, by the way, they might be converted. But if they have already been preordained to be without, how can Jesus say they might be converted? Oh, I mean, if they're the elect, is there even the possibility? Less than any time they should be converted. Listen, to me, that just blows us right out of the water. They could get converted. But, but if they have already been unconditionally elected and preordained, how can it be a should? But I don't want them. So I'm not going to do this. But they could. So I won't. Does that make any sense? Go to chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. And notice verse 4. Chapter 6 verse 4. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their what? Why didn't he marvel? I marvel that my father didn't elect more people. Did, did you catch that? Why is Jesus stunned at the rank unbelief? Wait a minute. By default, they're already dead. He's marveling because nobody's responding. You, you, you see... The way the Lord is even conducting his ministry, there, how anybody can conclude that there is this divinely elected group of people that God now has to regenerate so that they can believe. It justifies the way the Lord even conducts his, his ministry, okay? Um, verse 6, and he marveled because of their what? But they're dead. Why should he marvel? And whose fault is it that they're not believing. Whose fault is it that they don't believe? If you're going to believe the first tenet of high Calvinism, which demands that God has to regenerate you first, why doesn't the Holy Spirit regenerate them so that they can believe? I marvel that the Holy Spirit's not making these people born again. It, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Um, Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. And uh, Matthew chapter 23, Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. Okay, this, this is a common one. You, you're familiar with this. Matthew 23, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often I, would I have gathered thy children together. This is, this is an explicit will. I want to gather you people. My, my children, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, and look at the end of verse 37, and ye, what? I want to. Isn't that the eternal decree and counsel and good pleasure and will of Almighty God? I want to gather you together. But who? what's the problem? You don't want it. I marvel at your unbelief. Why aren't you believing it? Wait a minute. Lord, unfair. You see, this is the fallacy. How can God have this expectation of belief when God already fixed it so that you can't comply? Bizarre. Bizarre. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And uh, notice in John chapter 6, there's another one that is, is sometimes used, John chapter 6. In fact, it is used. <laughs> this, is a, this is a real common passage that a high Calvinist is going to use, John chapter 6, and uh, if you notice there at verse 37, okay, John chapter 6, verse 37, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast. So here's the Father who's going to give me people, okay? 
So if you're, if you're stuck in this philosophy, in this philosophical system, well, yeah, I wonder who the Lord's going to send. Go drop down to verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. And I will raise, so here we go. So now, if you're going to believe the doctrine of inability, verse 44, no man can come to me. Again, the basic tenet of total depravity because man has absolute no innate ability to will or to respond or go to God. They're dead. So the Lord, he says, nobody, nobody can come unless the Father sends him, or that sent me, Draw him. So there now is a proof text. Okay, I believe in total depravity and man's inability to will and to respond. So therefore, this verse can be used to support and defend my philosophical system. You can't do it, David. No man. David cannot come to the Lord Jesus unless the Father hyper-intervenes and draws David. And so therefore, you see that? I just proved to you, David has to first be regenerated. You see that? Regenerate. Where did that come from? Oh, no. David has to first be born again in order to receive me. It doesn't say that, does it? Absolutely not. It's, it's painfully obvious what the Lord is saying. Let's read verse 44 again. No man comes to me except the Father which hath sent me. Draw him. And I will raise them up at the last day. Verse 45. It is what? Written in the prophets. And they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh where? Do you read anything about God unconditionally preordaining and predestinating anybody to get regenerated and then be born again so that they can... The Lord Jesus is actually explaining how the Father is going to draw men to an understanding, identifying who the Lord Jesus is. How is the Father doing it? It is written, they shall, all, they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father, what's he going to do? Wow! Wow! So it's, it's not that complicated. You know how the Father's going to draw these people to Jesus? I'm going to tell you who He is. And if you by faith believe what I'm telling you about Him, the Father, you go to the Old Testament, Jesus' fingerprints are all over the Bible. Now, that's why Jesus spoke in parables. I don't want the unbelievers as an act of judgment against a Christ-rejecting nation during the time of Israel. I don't want them to understand this. Oh, no, because if they get it, they're going to be converted. I don't want them to be converted, so I'm not going to talk to them. But if you believe the claims of the Father as stated and declared in Genesis to Revelation, how can you miss them? Remember how Jesus knows, ye do err, not what? My scriptures. Don't you know they're talking about me? Even his disciples struggled with that. We're not going to go there for sake of time. Luke chapter 24. Remember what Jesus says. Listen, all of the prophets and all of the law, uh, uh, all of the Psalms, they were talking about who? Me. Okay? And the Lord says, and then the Lord opens up their understanding. How did the Lord open up their understanding? You see what Psalms chapter 22 says? That was me, guys. You know, I'm going to open up your understanding. You, you know what Isaiah wrote over there? That was me, guys. Remember what we read in Genesis chapter 3? That was me, guys. He's opening up their understanding. He is connecting the dot. The dots are there. Listen, it's the scripture. And we're not going to, we're going to find out. We're going to address this idea that faith is a work. Since we're in the book of John, this is what high Calvinists will do. Go to John chapter, we're in John chapter 2. Look at verse 29, real quick. Look there at verse 29. This is fascinating. Okay, so here I am, labeled as a synergist. Now, I am a sin, S-I-N, but sinner, that is, oh, you believe you've got to cooperate and work together with God, that my human activity is a necessary component. The equation to salvation is me plus God equals salvation, right? You believe in synergy. So, so the argument is this, well, then, you don't believe gift is a faith. I mean, faith is a gift. 
So you know what? Faith has to be a work. So John MacArthur, John MacArthur, he concedes that, well, uh, faith is a work, but this is how he would teach it. By the way, John MacArthur is a Calvinist, okay? You know, the Shepherds, all that kind of, Master's Seminary and all that kind of stuff. He's a Calvinist, okay? Uh, John chapter 6, verse 29. John 6, verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God that ye believe on him. Okay, I believe in this philosophical teaching. So belief, now this is how they read it. Again, you see how they now read. The, so if you look at how they read verse 29. Believing on him is the result of what? As they read verse 29. This is the what? Ah, John MacArthur, I gotcha. I gotcha. If you believe in Jesus, guess who did the work? It was God's intervening work that produced your capacity and ability to believe. You see how they read the verse? This is the work of God that you might believe. Well, you could read it that way. But wait a minute. Is that what the context teaches? And also equally important, are there other verses that will help define and explain what the Lord Jesus means when he says, this is the work of God that you believe. Don't let the Calvinist, like a runaway freight train, start promoting and advocating their philosophy. They're reading, they're reading their theology into this passage. Quite simply, you know, the work, let's look at verse 28. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might, what? Work the works of God. Are they asking, what do we got to do to believe? You see the question? What must we do, or what shall we do, that we might work the works of God? And by the way, what, what works are they even talking about? Look there at verse 14. Look there at verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Wait a minute. What miracle just occurred? The feeding of the 5,000. Remember that? So you begin at verse 1, you keep reading, you find out how the Lord was able to feed. 5,000 people. That's called a miracle, right? Look down there at verse uh, 26. Look down to verse 26. Um, in light of that, verse 26, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. In the context, you know what is still being dealt with? The miracle the feeding of the 5,000, the loaves of bread, the fishes, and so on and so forth, right? So in the context, the issue is, look at that, look at the work, look at the miracle. And, and so the question asked in verse 28, they said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the what? Now, we don't have any time. We'll, we'll go back to this passage. You go to chapter 10. You go to chapter 9. You go to chapter 4. You know what the works of God are? Didn't Jesus give to his disciples the ability to heal the sick, heal the blind? You know what Jesus calls them? Those are the works of God. And you know why is God working singular these works? Israel had a right. The Jews require a what? A sign. You know what Psalm says? We don't see our signs, therefore, we don't believe. Look back at verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come. What did the miracle validate and verify? He's the guy. In the context, and, and we'll look, not now, other verses when they ask the question, verse 29, or verse 28, what are we going to do to work? To work? They're talking, he's talking about the miracles. So Jesus answers in verse 29, Jesus said unto him, this is the what? 
The work of God has to do with this display of supernatural, miraculous activity. Why? So that you can believe. Do you see what's happening in the context? And I apologize, we're not going to go to these other verses because of time. Don't let philosophy interpret a verse. Let the verses surrounding help us understand. Jesus is not saying that believing on him is the work of God. He's saying this is the work of God so that you might believe. Again, belief is always going to proceed, okay? Um, oh. Amen. Yeah, we better stop. <laughs> okay, we'll stop. We'll stop. I actually wanted to do two, uh, total depravity and then, oh, no, we're, we're going to have to address. Well, is faith a gift? Is faith a work? No, no. Yeah, that's, I'm going to tell you the answer. Right. Faith is not a gift. Faith is not a work. What is it? See? Philosophy says it's got to be a gift. Okay? If it's not a gift, then it's your work. It's your human activity contributing to your salvation, all right? Then God is not God. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll keep going next time, right? Father, again, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you, Father, for the work of Calvary and the gift of eternal life that you extend to all who by faith believe your claim. We thank you, Lord, for the message. We thank you for that gospel uh, that you've entrusted to us. We thank you that you would have all men to be saved and come under the knowledge of the truth. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Again, may we hold it in highest esteem and may it work uh, effectually in us as we believe it to be the truth. And we ask in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.